Plaques on buildings lost in a tapestry of old South London streets, the streets of Chaplin's childhood, the events, the people, the places, all would provide the inspiration he sought in his Hollywood filmmaking. He built his own studios on a five-acre plot on La Brea Avenue, Hollywood in 1917, taking full control of his films. Each of the front administration buildings was slightly different. The total row looked something like an old English street village. Opposite the entrance was an area for building outdoor sets. The position of the South London street corner built for a dog's life is shown here. In this remarkable aerial shot, you can just make out that recreated street corner. Looking closer, you can even see the broken window panes. Hundreds of production stills were taken at every handle. This was Chaplin's way of working. Some photographs reveal often crudely built construction methods. The lamppost screwed to the pavement. And looking at the top of the wall, no roof. It was not needed. It would be out of camera range. A film which, like the kid, relied heavily on a plot set in the streets was A Dog's Life, released in 1918. Chaplin's character was something of a gentleman tramp, a poet, a dreamer, but not opposed to picking up the odd, partly smoked cigarette butt so South London was created on this Hollywood film set, inspired by the way of life he once knew and projected on those bioscope screens for the world to see. In 1921, 31 and the 1950s, Chaplin returned to London, Ritz or Savoy hotels, but always stealing away, often unnoticed, to wander those streets for inspiration. Chaplin's words are spoken by Martin Humphreys and are taken from my autobiography and my wonderful visit. I want to live in my youth again, to capture the moods and sensations of childhood so remote from me now, so unreal, almost like a dream. I need to turn back time to venture into the blurred past and bring it into focus. On Westminster Bridge, I watched the dark, silky waters drifting under it, I wanted to weep for joy, but I couldn't. From Westminster Bridge, I walked to the Elephant and Castle and stopped at a coffee store for a cup of tea. I could not sleep. It was five in the morning before I got to bed, exhausted. So let's join Charles Spencer Chaplin as he arrives in South London and follow his trail into the world he knew.
That was a clip from a two-reeler mutual, 1916, called 1AM. The um, plot is very, very similar to a Max Linder film, Taxi, and Chaplin was a big fan of Max Linder, who was an early comedian. Uh, the cab driver, incidentally, and that was born in Birmingham, and his name was Albert Austin. And Albert Austin was one of the members of the Fred Carno troupe that originally went out from here in South London. He lived in this road at number 164 for a brief period. Many theatrical agents had offices here. Where this road meets Waterloo Road on the corner of Upper Marsh, variety artists used to assemble to be given work by these York Road agents. Among the crowd are music hall locals George Roby, who lived in nearby Kennington Road, and Dan Leno, who lived in Ackerman Road, Brixton. Just past this gathering place were a number of pawnbroker shops, which the chaplains would have known. In her purse, Mother had several pawn tickets. She pawned Sydney's blue serge suit every Monday for seven shillings to help her through the week. It eventually became threadbare, and the pawnbroker would lend no more money against it. Mother went home in tears. Charlie's mother had lived for a short while in nearby Lambeth Square at number 14, directly in line with Upper Marsh. Today, incredibly, pawnbrokers have returned to the street. The shop looks almost the same as it does in this promotional glass slide for the pawn shop, one of the Chaplin films of 1916. The search for a genuine Victorian pawnbroker took me to this address at the junction of Kennington Lane and Renfrew Road. You've all passed this corner today. This indeed inspired the pawnbroker. On this corner, James Butterfield had a pawnbroker's shop in Victorian times. It's a wonderful link with Chaplin, as it was on the route to this workhouse. Rail history tells us that at the Central Criminal Court archives, a young boy and his mother sold over 100 stolen cotton bedsheets in that shop. And one year's hard labor, an indication of the times, and that was at a time when Chaplin was in the workhouse. So that pawnbroker's was functioning on that corner at that period of time. Charles Chaplin Sr., Charlie's father, was not a top-rate music hall artist, but he had status enough to get his songs published and have this photograph taken by a photographer, Henry Reed, on Tottenham Court Road. Unfortunately, he is only remembered today for his excessive drinking, which eventually killed him in 1901. He knew all the public houses in the area, the Three Stags, for instance. Charlie has documented that he saw his father here for the last time sat drinking in the corner. This is remembered today with a private drinking area called Chaplin's Corner. As he staggered down Kennington Road, popping in the tankard, then going to the ship, he would finally reach the White Hart. All these local pubs remember him today. Some of them display signs such as this, which proclaims, Charlie's dad drank here. To go in search of his father, Charlie went on his walks to this road near the railway arches. 
The famous Canterbury Music Hall stood here, built in 1851 by Charles Morton, who was known as the father of the halls. It was rebuilt a number of times as the overhead railway lines encroached year after year on its territory. There was two lines in 1888. By 1914, eight lines went in and out of Waterloo. The hall got pushed further and further over into Lower Marsh. Then a visit to the Canterbury Music Hall, sitting in a red plush seat watching my father perform. He was a quiet, brooding man with dark eyes and a very fine artiste. The trouble was he drank too much, which mother said was the cause of their separation. The Westminster Bridge Road had become very dilapidated. My God, look under the bridge. There's the old blind man. I am outside the Canterbury, the same old blind man I used to see as a child of five. Old earmuffs, clothes a bit greener with age, an irregular bush of whiskers, and the same stark look in his eyes that used to make me sick as a child. What a symbol from which to count the passing years. Through these tunnels you went to get to the auditorium, lavish tunnels decorated in their day with tropical fish tanks and glittering chandeliers. The stage side is now an NCB car park, remembered nearby by flats named as Canterbury House. Charlie recreated in the film Limelight a little stage act that he would have probably have remembered seeing on one of the programmes at the Canterbury. He is doing what the comics call their short leg routine. Typical of the musical acts of the day and nice little interpretation there by Charlie and Limelight. Westminster Bridge Road in the late 1890s looking south. Now it's dominated by the spire of Christ Church built in the 1850s on the site of the old Surrey Chapel. Its prominent position at the junction of Westminster Bridge Road and Kennington Road was quite important. Its spire is all that survives after the Blitz. Built by American <coughs> subscription in tribute to the abolition of slavery, the stars and stripes are set into the brickwork above the spire. My mother turned to religion in the hope that it would restore her voice. She regularly attended Christ Church in the Westminster Bridge Road and every Sunday I was made to sit through organ music and listen with aching impatience to the Reverend F.D. Mayer's fervent and dramatic voice echoing down the nave. When the Reverend closed the Bible, it meant that the sermon would end and they would start the prayers and the final hymn. His orations must have been appealing, for I would catch Mother quietly wiping away a tear. Along past Christ Church is Baxter Hall, where we used to see magic lantern slides for a penny. You could get a cup of coffee and a piece of cake there and see the crucifixion of Christ all at the same time. The hall adjacent to the church tower is on the site of the building in which Charlie saw these first lantern slides. They were, of course, temperance slides. Inside, notice the window and the raised floor area. The Reverend Mayor was a flamboyant Victorian preacher who flew his arms around in wild, dramatic fashion. 
Charlie undoubtedly remembered him and copied his style. known and hidden away courtyard just off Kennington Road has an important chaplain connection. When Mother was obliged to give up the stage, she lost sight of Mr. and Mrs. McCarthy, and seven years later she met up with them again when they came to live in Walcott Mansions in a select part of Kennington Road. Their son Wally and I were the same age, and as little children we used to play as grown-ups pretending to be vaudevillians. We would play theater at the back of Walcott Mansions. As the director, I always gave myself the villain parts. We would play until Wally's supper time, and usually I was invited. There were occasions, however, when my maneuvering did not work, and I would reluctantly return home. Mother was always glad to see me, and would prepare something for me, such as fried bread and dripping, or eggs and a cup of tea. The courtyard is to be found behind the Dalton tiled Walcott Gardens building. This impressive address was in Chaplin's day at the better end of Kennington Road. Go around the corner into this little road and turn right into the courtyard. Seven-year-old Charlie used to play and act with the other local street urchins here. This was their playground away from the busy main road. Will Murray, who appeared on stage as a character called Mrs. Casey, lived near here and recruited Charlie into a theatrical group which became known as Casey's Court. Looking into the court, notice the very low level windows which residents used to watch the kids play through. An old newspaper illustration from 1921 shows little change to the courtyard over the years. The original wall bracketed gas lamp still survives from young Chaplin's days. course from the kid which was in its day billed as six reels of joy 1923 first national and the little boy was of course Jackie Coogan a few hundred yards from Casey's court we come to the site of a row of nine terraced houses I arrived at three panel terrace and a strange calm came over me as I walked towards the house I stood a moment, taking in the scene. I looked up at the two top windows, the garret, 
where mother had sat, weak and undernourished, losing her mind. The windows were closed tight. They were telling no secrets and seemed indifferent to the man who stood gazing up at them for so long. Yet they communicated more than words. Eventually, some children came up and surrounded me, and I was obliged to move on down Kennington Road. Pownell Terrace was set back at an angle to the main road. A plane tree planted after the war helps us locate the exact spot by comparing the photograph I took recently to that from the one in the Lambeth archives. Demolished in 1966 and eventually replaced by flats, whoever lives today in the flat ringed is technically living in the airspace of the chaplain's third floor garret. <laughs> the houses it looked in the 1920s. Notice the iron railings across the front. By the 1930s, there was a wooden fence around. And here's the house just prior to demolition in the 1960s. Note the arrows indicating the third floor garret windows that Charlie and his mother would have looked through in 1903. There was some wonderful 16 millimeter home movie footage of Charlie visiting the house in the 1950s. Seven Kennington Road. Here, Charlie Chaplin Sr. lived with his mistress Louise, who incidentally died in this workhouse infirmary. There is a wrong date on the plaque. Charlie died in 1977, not 1978. Researchers proved that the plaque is also on the wrong house. It should be on 289 Kennington Road. Almost opposite is Black Prince Road, formerly Broad Street. Charlie's uncle Spencer was landlord at the Queen's Head pub here. It was he that paid for Charlie's father's funeral in Newington Cemetery. It's next to the railway line going into Waterloo. Charlie used to strain himself looking out of the carriage window to see if he could see his uncle Spencer at the pub. I had a scene in City Lights of the tramp avoiding a traffic jam by walking through a limousine and getting out the other side. When he slams the door, the blind flower girl hears it and offers her flowers, thinking he is the owner of the car. With his last half crown, he buys a buttonhole. Accidentally, he knocks the flower from her hand and it falls on the pavement. It dawns on him that she cannot see and passing the flower before her eyes, he realizes she is blind. The whole scene lasts 70 seconds, but it took five days of retaking to get it right. City lights took more than a year to make. This inspiration point was at the triangle piece of land between Kennington Park Road and Brixton Road. St. Mark's Church has imposing gateposts and iron railings and there was really a blind flower girl on that corner in Victorian times. Chaplin drew in his memory for city lights, and the part of the flower girl was taken by actress Virginia Sherrill, who was one of the leading ladies Chaplin didn't marry. <laughs> the whole church corner has a feeling of old time. Concrete pillars laboriously recreated by the studios in Hollywood together with the iron fencing. And you can see that if you just step out of an oval underground station.
We are told by Chaplin it took weeks to film that little sequence, um, only a few seconds long. And the, certainly the um, wrought iron fencing and the posts around St. Mark's Church today are identical, absolutely identical, to what we see on that clip from City Lights. Ah, there's Charlie taking a rest. It's been a long, nostalgic walk, but now we must venture behind St. Mark's Church and find a road with another chaplain link. Glenshaw Mansions, it was here that Charlie and his half-brother Sidney lived. And it was from here, from this front door, that they departed 101 years ago on that first trip to America. Nearby is Kennington Park. Now this was a place that has inspired the scripts, if they did exist, because a lot was filmed ad lib, for a whole group of his Hollywood films. Mother was at the gate of the Lambeth workhouse, dressed in her own clothes, waiting for us. She had applied for a discharge only because she wanted to spend the day with her children. It was early morning and we had nowhere to go, so we walked to Kennington Park, which was about a mile away. Sydney had ninepence tied up in a handkerchief, so we bought half a pound of black cherries and spent the morning in Kennington Park, sitting on a bench, eating them. At noon, we went to a coffee shop and spent the rest of our money on a twopenny tea cake, a penny bloater, and two halfpenny cups of tea, which we shared between us. Afterwards, we returned to Kennington Park, where Sydney and I played again while Mother sat crotcheting. In the afternoon, we made our way back to the workhouse. As Mother said with levity, we'll be just in time for tea. The main entrance into the park would have been well known to the chaplains. It must have inspired him to make what are today known as his park pictures, publicised in many fan magazines of the day. There is a dedicated chaplain children's playground in today's park. I've located as well the Kennington Cross Coffee House from chaplain days. The prices seem right, or perhaps they went to nearby Kennington Road. Notice that bloaters are mentioned at the bottom of the menu. Charlie is quoted as saying, give me a park bench, a policeman, and a pretty girl, and I'll make a comedy film. was from a film called 20 Minutes of Love. It was a one real film, strangely enough, that would have never run 20 minutes. It was a Keystone comedy released by Mutual in 1914, and Edgar Kennedy was the lover, and Minta Dufree was the girl. East Street extends between Walworth Road and the Old Kent Road, and it's still known as East Lane by many of the older locals. I was born on April the 16th, 1889, at eight o'clock at night, 
in East Lane, Woolworth. The blue plaque to Chaplin is on the wrong end of East Street. It's on a building which I discovered was a corn merchant's in Chaplin's days. There is an old mission hall on East Street, originally on part of the street that was known as Richmond Place. Today, it's the East Street Mission. Chaplin would have been influenced by this building. was the opening scene incidentally uh, from Easy Street and the lady was Edna Pavians and the film was made in 1917. Just opposite East Street Mission is Morecambe Street. It was formerly known as Camden Street and it was the birthplace of Chaplin's mother Hannah at number 11 in 1865. At 57 Brandon Street, Hannah and Charlie, Charlie's father, lived. And at the time of their marriage, they went to Larkham Street, St. John's Church. It was a sunny June day in 1885. Nearby are Methley Street and Bowden Street, both recreated in Hollywood. Mother had taken a room in one of the back streets behind Kennington Cross, near to Haywood's pickle factory, and the acid smell would start up every afternoon. At the end of our street was a slaughterhouse, and sheep would pass our house on the way to be butchered. I remember that one escaped to the amusement of onlookers. I giggled with delight at the capering and panic. It seemed so comic but when it was carried back to the slaughterhouse, the reality of the tragedy came over me. I ran indoors, screaming to mother, they're going to kill it, they're going to kill it. That comedy chase stayed with me for days, and I wonder if that episode established the combination of the tragic and the comic in my future films. The layout of this street with its T-junction is thought to have given the inspiration for Hollywood Street set, not only for Easy Street, but also for the kid. Charlie lived at 39, facing into Bowden Street. City Lights Court is a tribute to the rail-blind flower girl who lived nearby. The old Pittle factory is now a photographic studio and the whole street area almost unaltered since Chaplin's days. This cinema glass slide is typical of the promotional material of the period. Renfrew Road was an inspirational street for Chaplin. We have the fire station, inspiration for the firemen, the courthouse and the police station, inspiration for the film Police. The old Victorian fire station, incidentally it was once home to this museum, has two arched doors which have now been bricked over at the bottom, making them mere windows. This is how it looked in 1905, with a horse-drawn fire vehicle parked ready to be called out. Thank you. 
door to the fire station is the police court. This is now the Buddhist center. It dates from 1869 and was certainly known by the chaplains. The impressive wooden roof in the courtroom still survives. What stories that could tell. The entrance to the police cells and the original wood paneled walls are unique features of this building. The police station which stood opposite inspired Chaplin's film Police. However, the building that stands there today was rebuilt in 1938. That was a course from Easy Street, 1917, Two Reels Mutual. Uh, Eric Campbell was the bully, and in that very year, uh, tragically, Eric Campbell died in a car crash in Hollywood. He was one of the original people to go out from the Carnot Troupe. He was from Scotland originally. Mother was burdened with Sydney and I, and was in poor health, so she decided that the three of us should enter the Lambeth workhouse. We were aware of the shame of going to the workhouse. I thought it adventurous and a change from living in a stuffy room. We entered the workhouse gates and we were made to separate, mother going in one direction and Sydney and I in the other. I remember the sadness of that first visiting day, the shock of seeing mother garbed in workhouse clothes. We sat together, our hands in her lap. She smiled at our cropped heads and stroked them consolingly. 
From her apron, she produced a bag of coconut candy, which she had bought at the workhouse store with her earnings from crocheting lace cuffs. Sydney and I quickly adapted ourselves to workhouse life. Many people make the error of thinking that this workhouse and the buildings were where the inmates lived. Well, this is not the case today. It's the cinema museum. The master's house was where the workhouse master lived, worked and administrated the whole workhouse. This is all that's left of a vast building which covered an enormous area housing 1,400 people at its height. Nine-year-old Charlie would have slept in the male dormitory, most of it built over with flats. Lime Light House pays tribute to Chaplin. This is the entrance as seen 50 years ago. The gate posts have been rebuilt, but the entrance looks just as it did in Victorian times. The original architect's drawing clearly shows the structure of the building. In the film, The Kid, we see Edna Purveyance coming out of a similar building. Notice the gatepost inspiration and the architecture of the building. Chaplin looked for a building to replicate this workhouse as a charity hospital. He found it in Los Angeles, the Highland area of Los Angeles, and it's the Occidental College, which still stands today. Where have we seen that building before? Amazing. Occidental College have credits towards the kid. I don't know whether you noticed in that clip that when she left the charity hospital, she headed for the park to sit on a bench. We get those very little story in, in, in Chaplin's autobiography. The Elephant and Castle statue today with Spurgeon's Victorian tabernacle building still stands intact. You can see the statue here in its original position on the Elephant and Castle Theatre. If you go into Elephant Road behind the shopping centre, you will discover some old surviving areas Chaplin would have known. This restaurant is on the site of the old theatre, which is remembered by a wooden tablet sat into the wall. Hidden away, the Charlie Chaplin public house. Now, this is on the site of an old coaching inn where an old rheumatic man called Rummy Binks tended and watered horses. And Charlie was supposed to have copied his walk. Underground, we can see pictures there. That little alleyway is still there if you go around the back and up by the side of what was the Coronet Theatre. And it was the place that Chaplin was heading for on these walks.
that was from a dog's life, and uh, the lunch wagon owner was Sydney Chaplin, Charlie's half-brother. And there's been a wonderful book produced by an American university on the life and times of Sydney Chaplin and what a life story he had to tell. With his coat collar up, hoping not to be recognised, Charlie would then hail a taxi and head for his suite at the Ritz Hotel. The next morning, Southampton and a goodbye from its mayor, destination America. South London, familiar buildings, so thrilling, the very same buildings. Visiting Kennington had completed something within me, moods, memories, awakenings. From such trivia, I believe my soul was made. Goodbye, Elephant and Castle coffee stall, it's back over the river, leaving my childhood behind, dinner at the Ritz tonight. I realize that time and circumstances have favored me. I have been cosseted in the world's affections, loved and hated. So now I will end this odyssey of mine. I'm off to Southampton in the morning with its crowds, those same people who I pass by, unknown, on my departure for America those long years ago. They smile tenderly. It is very pleasant to be getting applause on my departure now. Thank you. 